Greg. Well, good afternoon on behalf of Andy, Kate and myself. Thank you all for dialing into our third of four human capital webinars taking place this year. This webinar considers the taxation of internationally mobile employees, or IMEs for short. As you all know, the taxation of IMEs can be subjective, complex, and opaque. We'll endeavor during the course of the next 60 minutes to bring some clarity to these difficult tax issues. The session is designed to be a practical guide for employers, flagging changes in the legislation and providing helpful tips and practical experience along the way. So, in terms of running order, first, Andy will explain how IME salary and bonus payments are taxed and the planning opportunities for inbounds and outbounds. Kate will then explain the key changes that took effect from 6 April 2015 to the taxation of securities income. She'll then explain how securities income is now taxed and then provide some atypical worked examples for inbounds and outbounds. And finally, I'll consider the interaction between UK and foreign income tax. I'll then look at how such income is treated from a social security perspective. I'll set through a couple of worked examples for inbounds and outbounds, and then I'll consider how incentives structured as conditional share awards are treated for UK tax purposes. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Andy. Thank you, Matt, and good afternoon, everyone. When we use the term IME, the majority of people consider it to relate to those employees that are on a common for a period of, say, a year upwards. Invariably, for individuals on a common for this duration, there will be tax implications in the home and or host locations. But it's important to remember that other kinds of working patterns can result in tax implications. I'll go through a few other types of IMEs. So, cross-border working roles. I was dealing recently with a company with an Austrian employee that worked three days a week in the UK and the remainder in Austria. He was paid and taxed via the Austrian payroll and it was assumed there were no UK tax aspects. This was a false assumption and we're now working with a company on a voluntary disclosure covering the last three tax years and working on an approach for ensuring that compliance is maintained for future cases. Then, with short-term business visitors, there is a huge amount of scrutiny by HMRC on this area. As little as a day spent working in the UK can trigger a PAY requirement in the eyes of HMRC, and it's important to consider whether the individual can be exempt from UK tax under domestic rules and or international rules. Even if they can be exempt from UK tax, there is a PAY requirement unless an agreement has been entered into with HMRC. More on this will follow in due course. Non-resident directors. This is another area of scrutiny by HMRC, as they can be considered office holders of a UK company. An HMRC starting point is they should be taxed in the UK on a portion of their earnings, even if not paid by a UK company which relate to their director duties performed in the UK, most notably sitting on board meetings. There may be scope in some circumstances to treat them as not taxable in the UK, but companies should work from an assumption that there will be UK tax implications until the position is reviewed. The general principle should be to keep a broad mind of what constitutes an IME, and where an individual is an IME, Consider at the outset what the tax implications are and make sure that your organisation have a way of tracking where your people are as the company will be exposed if the correct employment taxes are not paid. So we'll look at the next slide to consider some tax principles. When we refer to IMEs, we commonly refer to them as inbound, so into the UK, or outbound, out of the UK. For inbound and outbound IMEs alike, it's key to understand their UK tax residency position. From the 6th of April 2013, new residency rules became legislated under the Statutory Residency Test, SRT. These are too complex to go through in detail within the time confines of this session, 
but a couple of common scenarios that we see are for inbound assignees. If an individual is present in the UK for 183 days or more, basing the count on midnight during a UK tax year, they will be considered to be UK tax resident. For outbound assignees, if an individual is working full-time outside the UK and spends no more than 30 work days and 90 midnights in the UK during a full UK tax year, they will be considered as non-resident in the UK. In keeping with most of the SRT, there are definitions that sit behind what is considered as a work day and what is considered to be full-time work. Also, they, there are prorated day count uh, day counts for work days and midnights applied for a part year arriving or departing the UK. Well, there's a popular misconception that an IME cannot be subject to UK tax unless they are UK tax resident, and it's common to hear comments such as, well, they've not reached 183 days in the UK, so there's no tax issues, right? Well, that isn't correct. Let's assume we have an individual who only spends 120 days in the UK in the 2015-16 UK tax year and we're comfortable they are non-resident under the SRT. We then have to consider whether they come from a country with which the UK has a double taxation agreement or DTA. If there is no DTA, and good examples are Brazil, Dubai, other United Arab Emirates states, we have to ask whether the work in the UK is non-incidental or to put it another way, substantive in nature. There are no hard and fast rules on how many days can be worked before the work days become substantive in nature, as it's a qualitative rather than quantitative test. If you have an individual working as many as 120 days in the UK though, they will inevitably be considered as non-incidental or substantive work days, and therefore the non-resident would be subject to UK tax on their earnings for their UK work days. If there is a DTA in place, we have to consider whether that provides them with protection from UK taxation. Almost all treaties follow the same structure, which is that the exemption can be claimed if the following conditions are all met. On the slides, I've entered in the brackets the answers required so that an exemption under the DTA is available. Firstly, the IME remains tax resident in their home country and the IME does not exceed 183 days in the other country in any 12-month period. For the purpose of tax treaties, days are counted differently to for the SRT. For a tax treaty, the, day count, the UK counts days such that any part of a day constitutes a full day. The next condition that also needs to be met is that the IME is not paid by or on behalf of an employer based in the UK. Broadly, this means their remuneration remains paid by their employer outside the UK and the main risks and benefits of their work can be demonstrated to be for the non-UK employing company. If each of the conditions is met, exemption can be claimed under the DTA. Once you know an individual's tax residency position and whether exemption can be claimed from UK tax under either the domestic or DTA rules, what do you need to do to be compliant from an employment tax perspective? Well, let's address the main scenarios in turn. For inbound individuals that can be exempt under a DTA, a company needs to account for PAY in respect of these individuals unless a short-term business visitor agreement a one-off agreement, which is blanket level across all employees, is in place with HMRC. We often refer to that as an STBVA. If you have an STBVA in place, you're not required to account for PAYE, but the company remains responsible for tracking the time the individual spends in the UK and is responsible for submission of a report to HMRC in respect of all short-term business visitors by the 31st of May following the end of the UK tax year. Individuals from non-DTA countries that can be exempt from UK tax under domestic rules, i.e. the days are incidental, 
not substantive in nature, there is no requirement to operate PAY. However, as the issue of incidental or non-incidental days is open to interpretation, it would be advisable to seek an upfront agreement from HMRC that PAY does not need to be accounted for. The next category is inbound individuals that cannot be exempt from UK tax under a DTA or domestic rules. Here, as you would expect, UK income tax needs to be accounted for via PAYE, pay as you earn. One thing to mention here in respect of inbound individuals is the availability of Section 690 agreements. They allow a company to only have to operate PAYE on a reduced percentage of an employee's earnings. This may, for example, apply if you have an inbound individual who is non-resident in the UK and only working 50% of their time in the UK. Of course, here it should be considered what the tax implications are for the balance of the time that the IME spends working outside the UK. Then, there are outbound individuals that break UK tax residency. These individuals can apply to HMRC for a no tax code and typically would need to submit the UK departure form P85 so as to demonstrate to HMRC they will break their UK tax residency. Once an NT code is in place, the company does not need to account for PAYE. We, and indeed other firms, are seeing significant delays in HMRC processing NT codes at the moment, and this basically seems a byproduct of HMRC diverting their resources to tax collection activities such as employer compliance reviews. HMRC has said that a company can, by concession, apply an NT code before it's agreed by HMRC but that company will have a PAY exposure if they've incorrectly concluded that an NT code is valid. Finally, for outbound individuals that break UK tax residency, here the UK employer is required to continue to account for PAY. This can create cash flow issues if, as would typically be the case, there is a requirement for payroll to be accounted for in the overseas territory as well. There is scope to apply to HMRC for a net of foreign tax credit arrangement, which means that the foreign tax can be used to reduce the amount of UK PAY paid over to HMRC. In theory, this can present a solution to double tax withholding, but our experiences, net of foreign tax credit arrangements can be administratively difficult to operate as a result of the need for the overseas payroll to be basically speaking to the UK payroll and for one-off cases of IMEs they can in many cases be more of a challenge than a benefit. Our next slide looks at bonuses, and unlike a salary payment for which the earnings periods relate to the month in respect of which it's paid, bonuses generally, generally relate to longer periods. Ignoring specific payments such as signing on bonuses, bonuses normally have an earnings or performance period of a calendar year, financial year, or in the case of commissions, in relation to a specific period of sales. The general principle with bonus payments is that they're subject to tax in the territory in which they're earned. Another common mistake that we see is companies will tax bonus payments in full via the payroll where the individual is present at the time the payment is made. This is not the correct approach and results in compliance failure. So you have to consider the period when the payment was earned and not focus only on where the individual is at the time of payment. This is best demonstrated if we consider a couple of examples. For the first example, we'll look at an IME who receives a performance bonus for calendar year 2014 in March 2015. The individual had left the UK in January 2015 to take up a secondment in Dubai and has broken tax residency in the UK. So, at the time of the payment, the individual is not resident in the UK. So if you followed the same approach as for salaries, the payment would not be subject to UK tax. However, the bonus relates to a period when the individual was working and resident in the UK, and hence it is fully taxable in the UK. If an NT code is in place, 
the payment can be made gross of tax in the UK, but the individual will have to pay the tax on their self-assessment return. For the next example, we'll consider an individual who receives a bonus for a financial year to June 30th, 2015. On the 15th of January, uh, on the 15th of August, 2015. This individual had arrived in the UK on the 1st of January 2015 and established UK tax residency from that date. So, if the payment were to be taxed based on where the individual is present at receipt, it would be fully subject to UK tax. However, the individual was only in the UK for six months of the full earnings period of the bonus payment. This means that half of the bonus payment is outside the scope of UK tax and PAY only needed to be accounted for on 50% of the payment. Where there's a Section 690 agreement for an individual, you apply PAY to the same percentage of the bonus payment as you would to the salary payment. So, I'm going to consider some planning opportunities for inbound assignees. The natural starting point is to consider whether there is scope to claim exemption from UK tax under the DTA conditions that we considered earlier. If an individual is in the UK for a short period, this might entail managing their UK days so that they do not exceed the 183 days or not recharging remuneration costs where your transfer pricing rules allow those costs to remain with the home country entity. The advantage of not triggering UK tax is that there can be a considerable amount of administration involved where UK tax is due. A payroll needs to be operated, potentially as well as in the home country. A UK tax return will need to be filed, and likely tax filings will be required in the home country to recover any double taxation. All of this comes with professional costs to ensure that matters are correctly handled. Let's say that the individual will be in the UK for more than 183 days, so there will be UK tax consequences. Here the duration of this comment remains important, as it can have an impact on the quantum of UK tax due. If the assignee is here for not more than two years, then temporary workplace relief is available. Tax relief can then be claimed for reasonable housing on rent, council tax and utility, utilities, and for the individual subsistence costs. As for overseas workday relief, this is available to individuals who are not domiciled in the UK, broadly an overseas national who is not coming to the UK permanently and who has not lived in the UK for the last three UK tax years. During the tax year of arrival and the two subsequent UK tax years, relief can be claimed from UK tax on their salary, bonuses, share awards and benefits that relate to the, the percentage of their time spent working outside the UK. The individuals need to set up an offshore account and retain an appropriate share of their earnings outside the UK. As with other areas discussed, the rules are complex and specific guidance should be sought. On to tax-free relocation costs, and these are still restricted to £8,000. But if the individual has been living outside the UK and non-resident for the last two UK tax years, the relocation flight to the employee, their spouse, and children under 18 years of age can be claimed separately so they do not take up part of the 8,000 tax-free relocation costs. For this reason, there's planning by not paying cash allowances but instead reimbursing certain costs. So one of the key aspects here is similar to that for the inbound individuals. Can we claim exemption from overseas tax under a DTA? As outlined for the inbound individuals, if there is overseas tax triggered, there is potentially going to be the need to operate an overseas payroll and for tax returns to be filed in the home and host countries. The timing of the secondment can be important from a UK tax perspective in terms of whether the individual is outside the UK for long enough to break their UK tax residency. If you're sending an individual to a zero tax jurisdiction like Dubai or a low tax um, jurisdiction like Hong Kong or Singapore, you don't want to find out that the assignment is just too short by a couple of weeks or the individual has spent a couple too many work days back in the UK to break their UK tax residency. 
Of course, there may be commercial reasons that will be an overriding factor in the duration of the assignment, but it would be important to know how you're able to va access valuable tax reliefs. A further planning point can be in relation to national insurance. If someone seconded outside the UK, they will typically be subject to NIC, national insurance contributions, for at least the first 52 weeks of a secondment, although the duration will vary depending on the territory they've gone to. If an individual is not resident in the UK, they're not liable to Class 1A NIC on benefits such as housing, which are contracted in the company's own name. Matt's going to cover aspects of Social Security later in the webinar, but as indicated in the bottom bullet point, it's important to consider the differing rates of Social Security and the scope to keep the individual in or move them to the regime where the rates are lower. Lastly, where you have IMEs, it's important to know your policy approach in terms of who's responsible for the tax. At the two extremes, you have laissez-faire, where the individual is responsible for all the actual tax, higher or lower, and tax equalisation, where the company retains from the individual the tax they would have paid had they remained working in the UK, known as hypothetical tax, and the company pays the actual home and host country taxes. We work with clients on the policy or policies that they use, which need to consider the drivers behind the secondments and the territories they're sending individuals to. In cases where there is not a clear policy in place, it can create situations where the IME's expectations do not match the companies, which is clearly easier to ensure are aligned at the start of the assignment. Well, I'll pass over to Kate, who's going to address the issue of IMEs and share-based awards. I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thanks, Andy. Um, before we get into the detail regarding how IMEs are taxed in the UK, I think we should be clear on some of the terminology that is used in relation to equity incentives held by employees. An option is the right to acquire shares subject to meeting certain conditions, which is taxed under the share option legislation in the UK. These are different from share rewards, which can be paid out in cash by the company at its discretion, which are taxed like bonus payments. Restricted shares are those held by employees which are subject to restrictions which reduce their value. For example, if you leave, you forfeit those shares for less than their market value. The restricted securities legislation is very complex, but it seeks to tax the full value of the restricted shares at some point during which the period in which they are held. In relation to overseas share schemes, it's typical to hear the terms restricted stock awards or RSAs, and restricted stock units or RSUs. RSAs tend to be taxed under the restricted securities legislation here in the UK, but to determine under which part of the legislation the RSUs are taxed, it's necessary to review the documentation to confirm whether it should be taxed like an option or taxed as a cash bonus. And to recap, income tax charges can be triggered on exercise of an option by an employee in the UK and chargeable events arise in relation to restricted shares when those restrictions lift. For example, you no longer forfeit those shares for less than market value if you leave. Or charges can arise when those restricted shares are sold. So the rules I'm going to discuss concern share options and restricted shares and the changes to the law from the 6th of April this year. The legislation is very complex and there have been broad sweeping changes that employers of IMEs do need to be aware of. So before 6 of April 2015, where an IME was not resident in the UK on the grant of an option or on the award of a restricted share, and there was no expectation that he would come to work in the UK, the shares acquired on exercise or the value of the restricted shares on vesting remained outside of the scope of UK income tax even if that IME subsequently became resident in the UK or came to work in the UK. So the UK differed from most other OECD countries that have always sourced this type of income over an earnings period 
and tax the income according to where those duties are carried out. The UK has now been brought in line with many other jurisdictions and from 6 of April this year, the exclusion from income tax on exercise or vest has now been removed where the individual was not resident on grant of the option or award of the shares but subsequently came to work in the UK. So from 6 of April 2015, where an employee carries out UK work days during what the revenue term, the relevant period over which the option or restricted shares are held, those IMEs will pay income tax on exercise or vesting on a time apportioned basis according to the UK work days as a proportion of the total work days in the relevant period. So this change in the law applies to all options and restricted shares held by IMEs working in the UK during the relevant period, even where previously they were not taxable in the UK before 6 of April this year. So the taxable income arising on exercise of an option or vesting of a restricted share is therefore now earned over the relevant period. For an option, the relevant period is measured from the date of grant of the option to vest when it becomes capable of exercise. For restricted shares, the relevant period is from the date of award of those shares to the employee to the date of a chargeable event, so such as when the IME can sell those shares freely. The revenue advisor that income should be apportioned on a just and reasonable basis over the relevant period. So for those IMEs who are UK resident and claim the remittance basis during part of that relevant period, or where they have been non-UK resident during the relevant period, they are within these rules and their employers must determine the income tax liability arising in the UK on exercise or vest and whether it must be subject to payroll withholding. So in terms of what the employer must do, they've obviously got to determine the taxable income that arises on exercise or vest and apportion that income over the relevant period. They must subject to income tax the proportion of income which relates to UK workdays. The UK employer must operate payroll where the IME is acquiring shares in a listed company or the shares are readily converted into cash as would be the case on the sale of a private company. Income that relates to overseas workdays which is termed Foreign Securities Income, or FSI, is subject to the remittance basis rules and is not subject to payroll withholding by the employer. So from the employer's perspective, they must have details regarding the movements of the IME between different jurisdictions to ensure that they are compliant from a payroll withholding perspective here in the UK. And it's important to note that the requirement to operate payroll can remain for a number of years for UK employers. So for the IMEs, it's necessary for them to differentiate between foreign securities income which is chargeable and subject to income tax in the UK if it is remitted, so if it's brought on shore, and foreign securities income which is never taxed in the UK even if the IME remits it to the UK, what the revenue term as unchargeable foreign securities income. So there are two different differentiate between and ultimately chargeable foreign securities income arises where an IME is resident in the UK and claims a remittance basis in that tax year. So that foreign securities income that relates to that tax year will be subject to income tax if it is brought to the UK by the IME. Foreign securities income it is deemed to be remitted if the IME is holding shares in a UK company so in that instance, if they were resident during that tax year and if shares in a UK company, they will be taxable here on the remittance basis. Income tax on remitted income is to be paid by self-assessment by the IME if it is remitted to the UK. For unchargeable foreign securities income, if the IME is not resident in the UK for the tax year in the relevant period, 
that foreign securities income will be unchargeable and is not subject to income tax in the UK, even if it is later remitted. The same also applies to foreign securities income which relates to the, a non-UK part of a split tax year. So a sort of worked example might help to clarify how this works in practice. So we've got an employee and on the 6th of April 2015, she's resident in the US when she is granted a nil cost option to acquire shares in a NASDAQ listed company. It has a three year vesting period, so the option will vest in full on the third anniversary of the date of grant when she can exercise her option and acquire her shares. She works in the US full time until the 5th of April 2016. But from the 6th of April 2016, she spends 50% of her work days in the UK and the remainder in the US where she remains resident for tax purposes. However, on the 6th of April 2017, she becomes resident in the UK where she spends 85% of her work days but still continues to spend 15% of her working time in the US, and she claims overseas workdays relief in relation to those US workdays, so they aren't taxable here. She claims the remittance basis in the UK in the 2017-2018 tax year, so she is only taxable on her UK sourced income. She immediately exercises her option on the 6th of April 2018, and receives proceeds of £30,000. So the employee is subject to income tax in the UK and on the remittance basis as follows. So in year one, £10,000 is not subject to income tax, even if it is remitted to the UK, as this income relates to a period of non-UK residents. So she had no UK presence at all in that year, so it's, it's not chargeable on exercise, not subject to PAYE, and it's not going to be taxable if it is remitted to the UK because it's unchargeable foreign securities income. In year two, £5,000 is taxable in the UK and subject to PA on exercise as it relates to UK work duties. So there would be a requirement for her employer to operate payroll on £5,000. The remaining £5,000 that relates to the second year of the vesting period would be unchargeable foreign securities income as it relates to non-UK work duties when she was not resident in the UK. In year three, eight and a half grand would be subject to POA in the UK on exercise as 85% of her work duties were carried out in the UK. The remaining 1,500 wouldn't be subject to POA in the UK on exercise but it would be chargeable foreign securities income because she was ridden in the UK and claiming the remittance basis. So it would be subject to income tax if it was remitted to the UK or she was, as she was resident in the UK during this period. Therefore, of the, of the total £30,000 of income that she received on exercise of her option, grand would be subject to income tax on exercise by her employer. 15 grand would not be taxable in the UK, even if it was remitted, as it related to a period of non-UK residents, and 1500 would be taxable in the UK if it was remitted by her. So hopefully that helps to clarify some of the points that I've discussed, and I'll now pass you over to Matthew. Okay, thanks Kate. Um, so as Kate mentioned, amounts which count as employment-related securities under Part 7 of ITPA, which I'll refer to as securities income, and the basis for determining or limiting the proportion of such securities income that's taxable in the UK, set out in Chapter 5B of ITPA. Um, despite the introduction of Chapter 5B, there will be circumstances where there is no symmetry between the timing and or the basis of the taxation of securities income in the UK as compared to the applicable overseas jurisdiction. So, for example, in some jurisdictions such as Jersey or Belgium, share options may be taxed at grant rather than on exercise. No credit is given to the IME within Part 7 for this upfront tax charge on Grom, 
as the grant of the option is treated as exempt income by reason of Section 8 of ITPA. As I'm sure you're aware, no tax charge arises on the grant of an option in the UK, and as a result, the deductible amount at Section 480 of ITPA operates to exclude exempt income from being a deductible amount. One way to avoid a double tax charge in these circumstances is to consider whether the UK has a double tax treaty with a relevant foreign jurisdiction, and, if so, to see whether relief can be sought under its terms. If there is no double tax treaty, the IME may not receive any credit for the tax paid on the grant of the option. IMEs may also be subject to a tax charge by a foreign jurisdiction on the acquisition of employment-related securities. However, when calculating any tax charge under Part 7, amounts charged to non-UK income tax should be a deductible amount for the purposes of the tax calculation. This should avoid a double tax charge arising when the tax charge is calculated under Section 428 of ITPA. For the IME, uh, if they're UK residents on acquisition of the employment rate of securities or non-resident with UK duties, he or she may be able to enter into a number of elections. The most common of which is a Section 4311 election, agreeing to be taxed on the amount by which the unrestricted market value of the employment related securities exceeds the acquisition price at the date of acquisition. There may still be circumstances, however, in which the taxpayer may need to claim tax relief under a double tax treaty. This may be the case where, for instance, the foreign jurisdiction taxes the award on different terms to the UK. As Kate noted, where Chapter 5B applies, a UK tax charge will only be applied to the proportion of the total taxable amount which is equal to the time spent in the UK or performing UK duties, as compared to the total vesting period. However, the US, for example, doesn't apportion the total taxable income over the vesting period. Instead, it taxes it over the period from the grant of the option to exercise, meaning that if an option is not exercised as soon as it vests, a double tax charge may arise. So let's look at an example to see how the rules will be applied in practice. So if we assume that an option is granted to a UK resident employee on the 1st of January 2013, which will vest at the end of December 2015, so the relevant period here is three years. If the IME moves to the US on the 1st of January 2015, so that's two-thirds of the way through the vesting period, and then exercises the option on the 1st of January 2019, being six years following the date of the grant, then if we're looking at Chapter 5B, the UK would ordinarily look to assess two-thirds of the option gain as taxable specific income, as Kate mentioned, on the basis that the IME was working in the UK for two-thirds of the vesting period, and one-third of the option as unchargeable foreign securities income. However, the US would look also to tax two-thirds of the option gain itself, on the basis that the IME was in the US for four out of the six years, being between the date of grant and exercise. So under the UK-US Double Tax Treaty, the option gain would be apportioned over six years between grant and exercise, which would limit the UK to taxing no more than a third on the option gain. So, next, moving on to the even more complex and opaque area of Social Security. The general rule is that an employee pays Social Security in the country where he or she works. Unlike Double Tax Treaties, international Social Security agreements do not allow for apportionment of income. The NIC position of IMEs is different depending on whether the income is taxed as general earnings or as securities income. As with the old income tax rules, the pre-6 April NIC position relating to employment-related securities for IMEs was unclear and complex. It used to depend on whether an income tax charge arose whether the IME moves to an agreement country, an EEA country, or Switzerland, or to a non-agreement country. Also, whether the IME holds a certificate of coverage or portable document A1 to remain within a specific social security regime, 
or whether the IME moves to a location as an assignee or a permanent transfer. So you can see it's going to be it used to be quite a complex position. NIC was generally due on the employment-related income on an all-or-nothing basis and wasn't time portioned. However, under the new NIC rules, which took effect from the 6th of April this year, NIC liability on employment-related securities income will be based on the amount of time during the relevant period the IME is UK insured. And no account will be taken of the IME's residency position at grant, vesting, or exercise of the option. This may result in UK outbounds becoming subject to UK NIC on a proportion of the option gain for the first time. However, the intention behind these new NIC rules is to align the income tax treatment and the NIC treatment wherever possible. Previously, where an inbound was granted an option prior to arriving in the UK, the grant of which wasn't subject to UK duties, no UK NIC liability arose on exercise and there was no income tax liability. From the 6th of April 2015, an NIC charge would arise for inbounds on any part of the grant to vest period where they were covered by UK social security system. Although the income tax and NIC rules are now broadly aligned, the basis of apportionment is the key difference between the two regimes. As Kate previously mentioned, under the UK tax rules, will apply apportionment based on UK residents and UK workdays, whereas the UK NIC rules will apply apportionment based on which the time the IME is covered by the UK social security system. Often the UK NIC position and the tax resident position are the same, but that's not always the case. For example, where an IME is seconded from the UK to a non-agreement country, the IME remains within the UK social security system for an additional 52 weeks, i.e. the 52-week rule. Where the IME is subject to a certificate of coverage or the portable document A1, they remain within their home social security system for up to 24 months, regardless of any charge in um, a change in the income tax residency position. Although companies' UK NIC costs may be reduced in some circumstances, we tend to expect that the overall NIC costs will increase. The nature of international social security treaties means that it's not possible to entirely remove the risk of either a mismatch between the UK NIC rules and the laws of other jurisdictions resulting in a double tax liability, or a mismatch between the income tax rules in Chapter 5B and the NIC rules resulting in different amounts being charged to PAY and NIC. Again, as Kate mentioned, the UK tax and NIC rules for IMEs are very complex, but I've set out an example of how the social security liability will operate in practice for share awards held by IMEs. So, keeping the same fact pattern as in the previous example, whereby the employment rate of security is awarded on 1st January 2013, which vests at the end of December 2015, uh, number of days in that period is 1,095. If we assume that the total value of the gain is a million pounds, and if you portion that over 1,095 days, it results in uh, 913 pounds per day. So if the IME arrives in the UK from another EEA member state to work from the 1st of January 2014 and does not hold the portable document A1, then they'll be subject to UK NICs from the date of arrival. Therefore, the IME would be liable to UK NICs for the period 1 January 2014 until the 31st of December 2015, which is 730 days, meaning that 666,000 or two-thirds of the option gain would be subject to UK NICs. However, when the IME arrived, if he held the portable document A1 covering the period from the 1st of January 2014 until the end of December 2015, there'd be no UK NIC liability on the million pound gain. This would be in stark contrast to the UK income tax position where two thirds of the gain would be subject to UK income tax. Um, where the IME moves between the UK and an EC or social security agreement country, no double tax 
uh, liability or social security liability can arise. However, where an IME moves to a non-agreement country such as Australia, double social security liabilities are likely. However, the Social Security Contributions Regulations in 2001 grants IME some relief from a double liability to NICs. However, the just and reasonable override in Chapter 5B doesn't apply to NICs. If a double Social Security charge does arise in relation to an EE state or reciprocal agreement country, we understand that the taxpayer would need to contact HMRC to explain the position and request either an adjustment or a refund of the double Social Security liability. However, although we understand that HMRC will review the double liability on a case-by-case -case basis, there's no guarantee that an adjustment or a refund will be forthcoming, which is not particularly a satisfactory outcome. It is sometimes difficult in practice when we're looking at uh, RSUs to determine whether an award under a long-term incentive plan or a performance share plan is a securities option or a bonus paid in shares. There's been some uncertainty in the past as to how RSUs are taxed and how they should be reported. And as Kate mentioned, RSUs are popular with US companies. Some companies have taxed and reported their RSE awards as securities options such that the tax charge that arises on vesting was treated as arising under the securities options rules of Chapter 5, which meant that prior to the 6th of April 2015, no tax charge would arise on vesting if the IME was non-resident on grant and was not granted in respect of future UK duties. HMRC have historically challenged tax treatment of RSUs that vest when an IME arrives in the UK, either on the basis that it was not a legal option, or that it can be cash settled at the behest of the company, and therefore it's not a right to acquire shares, and should be subject to the general earnings charge under Section 62 on the full amount. Prior to the recent tax changes, whether an award was subject to a Section 62 charge or subject to a tax charge under Chapter 5, could affect the tax treatment for an outbound IME to a non-treaty country. As Kate mentioned, if it was treated as a securities option, Chapter 5 used to uh, tax the whole gain on vesting, whereas the general earnings charge was limited to a UK proportion. In practice, most UK double tax treaties provide that the UK income tax charge should be restricted to the UK proportion so only the practical impact was for UK outbounds going to a non-treaty country. However, RSUs that vest post 6 of April 2015 will only ever be taxed on the UK sourced portion of the gain. As I previously mentioned, prior to the 6th of April 2015, there was potentially different outcomes for income tax purposes depending on whether the award was subject to general earnings charge under Section 62 or a Chapter 5 charge, but this distinction has now fallen away as both taxing provisions will be applied based on the proportion of the vesting period the IME was in the UK. So we've got uh, a few action points. So. What are the key points here to take away? Well, first, you'll need to understand these new rules and budget for the tax and NIC liabilities that may arise and operate PAYE and NIC correctly uh, where appropriate from this tax year onwards. Second, due to the complex nature of many employee incentive arrangements, you'll need to keep accurate records of employees' movements between different countries over the lifetime of each award. A review of your systems and procedures is advisable so that any necessary changes can be made and any missing data for earlier years can be captured. Uh, third, I'd recommend that you carry out a full review of all your incentive arrangements in which IMEs participate to determine how they'll be affected by the new rules and to ensure that the company secures a corporation tax deduction equal to the amount of income incurred by employees on the exercise or vesting of awards. The review should cover existing awards held as at 6 April 2015 by employees with UK work days during the vesting period. And finally, it's important to note that there will be UK 
income tax liabilities where an employee has worked in the UK during the vesting period, even if the employee has actually left the UK before exercise or vesting. So we've covered some of the key tax issues associated with IMEs, but I know we've received some web questions which we'll endeavour to answer. Um, the first question we've got is, uh, please can you tell me about the latest update by HMRC to the short-term visitors agreement and the significance of 30 days? Andy, do you want to pick that one up? Yes, sure then, Matt. So, um, yeah, the revenue in July issued just an update in respect of short-term business visitor agreements, and it was um, in response to companies making representations so it was very cumbersome to operate PAY on individuals with irregular patterns and fairly uh, limited uh, presence in the UK. So the HMRC have um, confirmed that for the 2015-16 UK tax year, they will allow that where an individual um, is not eligible for relief under a double taxation agreement, or they're not eligible for relief from PAY under UK domestic rules, if that individual has been in the UK for no more, or undertaken work in the UK of a substantive nature for no more than 30 days, and providing the individual isn't a non-resident director, they will allow a payroll run to be operated by the end of the UK tax year, so a single payroll run operated with the UK tax payment by the 19th of April following the tax year. So what we had previously was that companies, when they had individuals that couldn't be uh, exempt under a double taxation agreement and where there was or there was no DTA, the employer was responsible for operating PAY basically dur for the duration of the tax year to the extent the individuals were present, which obviously created a, a problem because it could be cumbersome for the company to do that on a month-by-month uh, -month basis. So like I say, the revenue have now given this concession, but it is specific to individuals that will be in the UK for no more than 30 substantive uh, work days in the year, such that you effectively do one payroll run by the end of the UK tax year. Okay, thanks. Um, the, the next question is, Andy made reference to the statutory residency test. Um, what is it and where can we find it? Uh, I'll pick up this one. Um, so for tax years 2012-13 and earlier, um, the extent to which an individual was subject to UK tax depended on whether they were residents, ordinary residents, or domiciled in the UK for the relevant tax year. However, the Finance Act 2013 contained measures that, um, with effect from the 6th of April 2013, abolished the concept of uh, ordinary residents for tax purposes and replaced the pre-existing case law based residency rules with a new statutory residency test which um, Andrew uh, and Andy alluded to earlier. So from that date, the 6th of April 2013, the extent to which an individual is subject to UK tax depends on whether he or she is uh, resident under this statutory residency test or domiciled in the UK for the relevant tax year. The underlying principle remains that those who have the strongest link to the UK should pay more tax than those uh, where they have connections which are weaker. However, the statutory resident test is quite complicated to navigate round, and unless you're really familiar with it, I'd recommend talking to us about classifying any particular individual. Um, we've got a, another, another question, have we? Yep, there's another question that's come in again on... Um I, uh, most of the questions we've had on the uh, have been on um, the issue of short-term business visitors. So I've got a question which is, do we need to account for PAY or report on a short-term business visitor agreement all overseas employees working in the UK regardless of their connection to a UK company? So for the purpose of, of this question in answering it, um, we'll assume the legal employer is a non-UK employer so effectively a company outside the UK. So if an individual from, a, from an overseas, if an overseas, em, uh, overseas employee is in the UK working for the benefit of or under guidance of a UK employer, then the, what's called the host employer uh, rules apply. And this would effectively mean that PAY should be applied by the UK company 
in respect to that individual's remuneration unless that individual is eligible for relief under the double taxation agreement and hence the um, individual can be included on the short-term business visit agreement. So let's say if you have a situation where an individual is working at the premises of a UK company but not um, necessarily for the benefit of the UK company, we would suggest in this case that the employer operates PAYE unless there's a short-term business visit agreement or unless the employer has sought clearance from HMRC that no PAY is required because the individual is working in the UK unrelated to the UK business. If an individual is working at the premises of a UK company, I beg your pardon, if an individual isn't working at the premises of a UK company and their work is not for the benefit of a UK company, under those circumstances, we'd say that that's outside of the scope of PAYE. The only thing I would say there is, if you do have an individual working, a, 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 an overseas employee working in the UK, unrelated to a UK business, then there is always the issues of considering whether that could generate a tax presence in the UK, which equally has um, significance from a corporate tax perspective. Okay, so uh, thank, thank, thank you, Andy, for that. Um, if uh, anyone has any other additional questions that we haven't answered during the session, because uh, I see that we've got quite a few come in, or any issues dealing with the taxation uh, of IME, uh, their IME population, our uh, contact details are set out on the final slide, and we'll be very happy to discuss these with you. So uh, all that's left for me to do now is to thank you very much for attending, and I wish you uh, a nice afternoon.